For those of you who click out of a video in the first 30 seconds, I'm going to get right to the point. I am now reading from Nathaniel Hawthorne's diary what he had to say about Margaret Fuller. But she was a person anxious to try all things and fill up her experience in all directions. She had a strong and coarse nature, which she had done her utmost to refine with infinite pains, but of course it could only be superficially changed. The solution of the riddle lies in this direction, nor does one's conscience revolt at the idea of thus solving it, for, at least this is my own experience, Margaret has not left in the hearts and minds of those who knew her any deep witness of her integrity and purity. She was a great humbug, of course, with much talent and much moral reality, or else she could never have been so great a humbug. But she had stuck herself full of borrowed qualities, which she chose to provide herself with, but which had no root in her. And then we move to the next part of the quote. There never was such a tragedy as her whole story, the sadder and sterner because so much of the ridiculous was mixed up with it, and because she could bear anything better than to be ridiculous. It was such an awful joke that she should have resolved, in all sincerity no doubt, to make herself the greatest, wisest, best woman of the age, and to that end she set to work on her strong, heavy, unpliable, and, in many respects, defective and evil nature, and adorned it with a mosaic of admirable qualities, such as she chose to possess, putting in here a splendid talent, and there a moral excellence, and polishing each separate piece, and the whole together, till it seemed to shine afar and dazzle all who saw it. She took credit to herself for having been her own Redeemer, if not her own creator. And indeed, she was far more a work of art than any of Mosier's statues. But she was not working on an inanimate substance like marble or clay. There was something within her that she could not possibly come at to recreate or refine it. And, by and by, this rude old potency bestirred itself and undid all her labor in the twinkling of an eye. Now, that was from a book called Hawthorne and His Wife, a biography by the Hawthorne's son, Julian. And uh, if you want to look it up, I'm reading here from an original. Uh, this is page 260 and page 261 I was reading from. And the point of all this is that in my research, I have determined that Margaret Fuller was an imposter. And I've said that <clears throat> many times, literally a fraud, as a philosopher and as a writer. And she bolstered up her appearance by falsely claiming Matthew Franklin Whittier's writing, my own past life writing. And we're talking about everything signed with an F in the dial, the Transcendentalist magazine, The Dial. That was not F for Fuller, it was F for Franklin. Matthew had used that before and used it afterwards. And the star, or single asterisk, in the New York Tribune from uh, December 1844 until August of 1846, with a few exceptions, all that is Matthew Franklin Whittier. So uh, she created herself more or less out of thin air and the substance of it was borrowed or stolen. So um, all this becomes important because we have a new clue. Now, I don't happen to have uh, the edition that, uh, that I need to read from, so I'm going to take it from a book called Margaret Fuller Critic. This is uh, edited by two scholars, Judith Matson bean and Joel Meyerson. I believe Joel Meyerson has passed on. And this contains all of the star-signed uh, reviews, most of which were actually Matthews. And, of course, they go on the assumption that it's all Margaret Fuller and all of their uh, notes and commentary and everything else assumes that it's Margaret Fuller. The ones that they didn't fit into the book proper, they have in a CD on the back. Um, I got this from Thrift Books a little bit cheaper, but it's like $190 if you want to buy this. 
In the June 22, 1846 edition of the New York Tribune is a review of Mosses from an Old Manse by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Now, the Old Manse is the house that uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne and Sophia Hawthorne rented in Concord, Massachusetts. So uh, this is a review by Matthew signing as a star of his book about that. And uh, we find that particular review on page 453 of this book. And there is a telltale clue in here because the author drops a hint that he had visited the Hawthorns at the Old Manse on more than one occasion. So the gauntlet is thrown here. Uh, could this be Matthew? Could it be Margaret Fuller? Is it more likely to be one than the other? We would assume that it's more likely to be Margaret Fuller. She was one of the transcendentalists. She visited Concord. She was friends with Ralph Waldo Emerson and so on. Matthew also knew the transcendentalists and also visited Concord, I would guess. Um, but there's not so much record of that. Now, um, in this review, we read... The introduction to the mosses in which the old manse, its inhabitants, and visitants are portrayed is written with even more than his usual charm of placid grace and many strokes of his admirable good sense. Those who are not, like ourselves, familiar with the scene and its denizens will still perceive how true that picture must be. Those of us who are thus familiar will best know how to prize the record of objects and influences unique in our country and time. So the star writing this review had visited the, uh, the old manse and presumably the Hawthorns on more than one occasion. So the question is, how close was Margaret Fuller with the Hawthorns and how likely is it that she was a visitor on more than one occasion? Now, we have here uh, one of the series by Robert N. Hudspeth. It's called The Letters of Margaret Fuller. He's the editor. This is volume three, which covers 1842 to 1844. The Hawthorns rented the old manse beginning in 1842 to 1845. So in 1842, 1844, we should see some letters back and forth or some letters to the Hawthorns from Margaret Fuller, and they should be fairly warm letters, if indeed she was a frequent visitor there. But we don't. In this book, there's only one letter to the Hawthorns, period, in the whole 1842 to 1844. And it's not really a very warm letter. It's a rather formal letter. And what she's doing is basically saying, I'm sorry to intrude again. Apparently there had been some friction I'm sorry to intrude again, but I would like to ask you to hire my brother Charles on your farm because he needs a, a job and a good circumstancing. So um, let me read a little bit of the opening and a little bit of the closing just to give you a feeling of this letter. Dear Mr. Hawthorne, you must not think I have any black design against your domestic peace. Neither am I the agent of any secret tribunal of the dagger and cord, nor am I commissioned by the malice of some baffled lover to make you wretched. Yet it may look so when you find me once again in defiance of my failure last summer, despite your letter of full exposition, once more attempting to mix a foreign element in your well-compounded cup. In other words, she feels like She's intruding in some sense, and something has gone on in the past that wasn't so uh, pleasant. Okay, we don't know what that is. I haven't delved into it to see what could possibly have happened. Now, the way that she closes this is, In fact, I am not annoying you with the proposition, being employed only to sound your dispositions. But as I know no diplomacy and can move only in a straightforward direction, you have the present blunt epistle and are only requested to imagine all has been done in the indirect, delicate style of old European policy and answer accordingly. I should like much to hear something about yourselves, whether there is writing or drawing or modeling in what room you pass the short, dark days 
and long bright evenings of January, what the genius loci says, whether through voice of ghost, or rat, or winter wind, or kettle singing symphony to the happy duet, and whether, by any chance, you sometimes give a thought to your friend, Margaret. That sounds like she's been kind of uh, rejected, doesn't it? But that's the only letter in that whole book of 1842-44. So uh, something is very wrong with this picture because the star sounds like he's been there many times. And Margaret Fuller apparently hadn't been there for a while, and the last time she was there was kind of discordant somehow or other. So that's just one clue out of many that Margaret Fuller was not the star writing in the New York Tribune.